Greetings friends, my name is Lucas Mann and a friend of mine and myself come out here this evening to bring to you the good news of Jesus Christ, to bring to you the message of life. Friends, we come out here to plead with you concerning your soul and your eternal destiny. Friends, we understand that the Bible says that after we die comes the judgment. After we die, we live on. This is not all there is to our existence, merely this world. In fact, God has stamped eternity upon every man's conscience, as it were. We know that we are made for something more than merely this temporal life that we live. And friends, we understand that the Bible clearly presents that there are two destinies, there are two places one can go after they die. One being with God Himself in paradise, in heaven, and of course one being hell, the place where God's enemies are punished for their sin. And friends, we care enough for you to, to share with you the gospel, to show you your sin and to show you your error, but then to point you to the Redeemer of God's people. See, Jesus Christ Himself said that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus Christ came in the into the world to save sinners, to save those who are dead in sin and on the road to destruction, on the road to hell. And He came to bring them into eternal glory. And friends, He accomplished this through His atonement upon the cross. He accomplished this through dying upon the cross for their sin. And then being raised on the third day later, and then being exalted to the right hand of God in heaven. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ lives to make intercession for all those who draw near to God. Friends, what a glorious reality that is, that Christ, the great high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, reigns and rules over all creation as the sovereign Lord. And He Himself says, For the one who comes to Me, I will by no means cast out. What does He say in Matthew 11? Come to Me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And He's not talking about merely some weariness about your financial troubles or perhaps heartbreak over a lost relationship. Rather, He is talking about weariness in terms of your right standing before God. Because every religion in the world says unto man, if you were to be made right with God, you must perform some duty. You must do some sort of religious work, some sort of outward remedy to address the inward deadness. However, my friends, this does not remove the problem. In fact, it just adds to our guilt. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we, by which we must be saved, other than the name of Jesus Christ. It is only by trusting and resting in the finished work of Christ that we are justified before the Holy One. See, friends, we do not have a right conception of God in our own minds by default. In fact, we have a warped view, a distorted view of God. In fact, what we are, what we are inclined to do because of our depravity is to make a God in our own minds who suits our own desires. And so God in His mercy reveals Himself to us by way of special revelation in the Scriptures. And so we have the objective standard that we can go to, the Word of God, to see what God says about Himself and what God says about us. What do the Scriptures principally teach? The Scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. And my friends, the will of God for your life and for my life and for every person's life on the face of the earth is to believe the one whom He has sent, to deny self and to take up your cross daily and to come after the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, for the one who loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. Friends, we come to warn you about the impending judgment. God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. We know from the Psalms that the Scripture says God is angry with the wicked every day. That's true. God is merciful. God is loving. But see, people want to pick and choose the attributes of God that best suit their sinful desires rather than seeing who God is in Scripture. 
But friends, there is salvation from the holy wrath of God. And it is found only in the vicarious atonement of Christ upon the cross. And so this evening, that is our chief end, is to point you to Christ, is to point you to the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, who saves to the uttermost all who call upon Him, all who come to Him for grace. We come here to bring His name glory by telling you this truth, this precious truth. The Gospel is the pearl of great price, my friends. It is the, the, the message... The only message in the world that is the power of God. Paul says that in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then he says in verse 17, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, But the righteous man shall live by faith. It is by faith in the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. My friends, we are created to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. This is what Christians have believed throughout the ages. This is what the Scriptures teach, that we are made to the glory of God. So we seek to glorify God this evening, friends. We are not out here just for you, but for God Himself preaching unto His glory. The text of Scripture that I would like to base... My exhortations this evening upon is found in Romans chapter 4. In Romans chapter 4, verse 16, the Apostle Paul writes these words under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. He says, For this reason, it is by faith, speaking of reception of the promises of God. And that is salvation. In its essence, he's talking about salvation. It is by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise, he's speaking of the promise that God gave to Abraham in the Old Testament times, he says, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the descendants, or excuse me, of, of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And I would like to speak on that this evening, to preach on that, on those children of Abraham who are according to faith. Abraham's children according to faith. Friends, as we know from the record of history found in Scripture in the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is historical record. It's not fiction. It's not merely allegory. My friends, the, the Word of God is literally true from beginning to end. And so what we find in Genesis is a historical record and that goes all the way back to Genesis 1 1 through 3 and then all the way 1 through 11 of the creation of the world that's literal I'll say this on a side note if you have any friends who call themselves Christians but deny Genesis 1 through 11 and think themselves to be Christians I would encourage you to run away from them it's a dangerous thing to doubt the Word of God all the Word of God all the Word of God from beginning to end is pure. It cannot be broken. It is powerful. It is effectual. We know that Isaiah says, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of our God abides forever. The Word of God cannot fail. It cannot move to the left or to the right. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And so knowing that, when we go to the Old Testament, we find the story of Abraham, a man of faith, a man who believed God. And as we know from Genesis 15, 6, God credited that to him as righteousness. Friends, there is no difference between the way people were saved in the Old Testament times and in the way that pe people are saved today. It is all by faith in Jesus Christ. It is by faith in the Son of God. Friends, would you put your faith in Christ this evening, this day? Today is the day of salvation. Now is the appointed time to turn to the Son of God. Time is running out, friends. Thank you for doing everything you do, man. God bless you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved.
Friends, Abraham believed God's promises. And we know that Abraham, of course, did not receive God's promises on the basis of law keeping. That's what Paul is getting at here in Romans 4. That's really the main argument is that Abraham's salvation came about not by his own effort, but by, by his receiving God's promise. Because that's where the power is. That's where the saving power is, is in the promises of God. And we, we see Paul outline that in these verses. And then he says, So it is with all those even to this very day, thousands of years later, every person who believes upon the Lord Jesus Christ truly, and who is truly born again of the Spirit, are the sons and daughters of Abraham. Though they may not be literally or physically, they are spiritually his descendants because they walk in his footsteps. They walk in the footsteps of of the same faith which he possessed. God bless you, sir. Thank you. And that's what I want to explain this evening and tie that into the Gospel because that directly relates to the Gospel. That we do not obtain... Amen, brother. God bless you, sir. Thank you. That we do not obtain a, a right standing before God by birthright, by obedience to a set law code, but rather by believing the promises of God. And so I want to consider that this evening. Before we do, of course, context, as I mentioned very briefly, Paul is outlining an argument. This isn't just all found in verse 16. He says in verse 9, speaking of salvation, he says, Is this blessing then on the circumcised or the uncircumcised also? For we say, faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. In other words, is this merely for an ethnic group? And of course, in Paul's day, that'd be the Jewish people. He says, no, it's for all people. God shows no partiality. There's a lot of talk these days about race and racism. But the idea of race is heresy. The idea of race is heresy, my friends. It's against the Bible. It's unorthodox to believe that there is such thing as race, different races. For Scripture teaches us, and we find this in the historical record in Genesis, that every person on the face of the earth descended from two people, Adam and Eve. Evolution teaches that there are different races. Evolution teaches that. That's an evolutionary worldview. And that's where we got the worldview of Adolf Hitler which ultimately ended in the extermination of 6 million Jews. Ultimately, 11 million people were killed in the Holocaust. And then look at today. In America, we have the Holocaust of abortion happening. And Planned Parenthood, as we know, was founded by Margaret Sanger, who herself was a, a racist. She hated black people, and she wanted black people exterminated. That's the founder of Planned Parenthood. And it was all based on a lie. It was based on a lie. If men had simply believed the promises of God, believed the Word of God, those things wouldn't have happened. And that's why we need salvation, because there is so much evil, there is so much wickedness bound up in the heart of man. In fact, we know that in the Old Testament it talks about circumcision of the heart. That is that we have a, a built-in hardness of heart. In fact, we, as we know from Paul's words in Ephesians 2, we are dead in sin and altogether haters of God. And so God, in order for us to be made right with Him, must give us new hearts. See, He must initiate a work of grace in us. And He does that. He does that all across the world in people's lives. He's done it in mine. And the Bible term for this is being born again. Being born of the Spirit. Being born of ab from above. And you ask, how does this happen? It happens when God wills it and how God wills it. It's a mysterious act of the Spirit of God. Nicodemus asked Jesus, how can these things be? And Jesus said in John 3, that the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So Paul continues, verse 9, Is this blessing then on the, uncircumc or the circumcised or the uncircumcised also? 
For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but also who follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. That's the argument Paul gives, and he adds further evidence to that. He wants to labor on this point in the next few verses. Verse 13, For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. You see Paul contrasting these ideas. It's not by keeping the law, but by faith. Verse 14, For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void, and the promise is nullified. For the law brings about wrath. But where there is no law, there is also no violation. So he says God's law was intended to show us our sin and our deserving of His wrath, of His holy justice. But the law also points to someone who kept it, who was promised to come and keep it all the way back, beginning in Genesis 3, and then revealed by farther steps until the ultimate coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, where He Himself, by His own might and power, and His own piety, kept the law of God on behalf of all those who would ever believe Him. And therefore, He accomplished the salvation of God's people. And so let's look at verse 15, uh, 16 now and consider Abraham's children according to faith. He says, For this reason it is by faith. It is by a divine persuasion. And that's really what faith means. When we go down to the original language, that Koine Greek... which is what the New Testament was written in, we find that this word means to be persuaded. And who are we persuaded by? What are we persuaded of? We are persuaded by God of the truth, of the veracity of His Word, and of His power to save sinners. He says that it may be in accordance with grace. That's ultimately the end of this, my friends. Salvation is by faith because it must be by grace. Thank you, ma'am. God bless you. It is by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace. The word grace means favor apart from merit. See, God is in the business of bestowing upon filthy sinners like you and I divine mercy to the extent that He Himself would allow us to live with Him forever in heaven. But this heavenly reality, this eternal state, can only be experienced by those who turn to Christ. It's exclusive, friends. God's love and mercy is exclusive. And it is discriminative. Not every person not every single person will go to heaven. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 7, many will go to destruction. Many will go to hell. Most people will go to hell. Jesus Himself said that. But praise be to God that God would in His mercy even allow anyone to go to heaven. We ought not wonder why God allows most people to go to hell. But rather we ought to wonder that He even lets anyone into heaven. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. God said that, my friends. We ought to not wonder that, oh, he hated Esau. We ought to, to be in awe of the reality that he loved Jacob. Because Jacob was just as evil as Esau. And I am just as evil as you, and you as evil as me. It is by grace. What does he say? He says... 
so that the promise will be granted to all the descendants. What was the promise that Abraham ultimately believed God concerning? Was it merely about some land? Was it about something else? What was it about? It was about salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. For we know that Jesus Himself said in John 8, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. From a distance, Abraham looked to Christ, as it were, and saw the Son of God, the skull-crushing seed of the woman, the Redeemer of God's elect, and in Him He placed His trust. And so this promise is granted to all the descendants whether you are Jew or Gentile, black or white, rich or poor, famous or unknown, someone who has lived a life racked with sin or who has lived a relatively clean life but has nonetheless transgressed God's law, God is the God of all, my friends. The God of all peoples, of all languages and tongues. We find in Revelation 7, that in heaven there will be people rejoicing and praising God from every tribe and tongue and nation and people. <coughs> Excuse me. What a glorious reality that God in His mercy has predestined and has chosen a people to Himself. That includes individuals from every tribe, tongue, nation, people, and ethnic group around the world for His own glory. He says, not only to those who are of the law, in other words, not only Jews, but who else? But also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And we know from the context of Paul's culture and to the people to whom he's writing, one of the issues that racked the early church was the Judaizers, were Jewish converts to Christianity who had propagated and uh, or we could even, I don't know if we could even call them Christian but they said that you have to keep the law of Moses to be saved and that created confusion amongst the believers in the first century because the Gentiles were asking themselves well do I have to take upon myself all these different commands now in order to work my way up to God do I have to adopt every aspect of Jewish culture to be converted and the answer was no because salvation is by faith it is by grace. And Paul says, Abraham, this patriarch, this man of faith, is the father of us all. God has inspired these words, my friends. God has caused these words to be powerful. They are His words. The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing to soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. How powerful is God's Word? I have read many books, but the Bible reads me, my friends. The Bible tells me who I am. It knows me better than I know myself. And it, it discloses to me the deep things of God and tells me His glorious and most wondrous thoughts. And it tells me of the precious Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that came forth out of God Himself. The message that Christ Jesus died and was buried and was raised on the third day. The message that the Apostles preached. The message that the Reformers preached. The message that the Puritans preached. The message that all of God's people throughout all ages, all the way back in the very Garden of Eden, had believed. That's right. Adam and Eve were saved, my friends, by believing in the skull-crushing seed of the woman, in Christ who was to come to purchase redemption. God has inspired His Word, my friends, and given these wondrous promises. And He is so holy. Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Your conscience tells you of the justice and the righteousness of God. 
and of your breaking His law, my friends. Listen, this is important. I say this out of love for you. I don't hate you. I love you. I'm, I must tell you this. I would rather wound you with the truth than comfort you with the lies that will damn your soul. Friends, God is holy. Holy, holy. And we must, we must deal with this reality of the holiness of God. How can we stand before the One who is a consuming fire? How can we stand before the One who sent down fire from heaven to consume Nadab and Abihu, the sons of, Le uh, the sons of Aaron, when they offered up strange fire before the Lord and simply because they had transgressed one simple, small command of God, He judged them accordingly. How can we stand before this One? We can stand before Him because of His grace as it is revealed in His Son. And so I exhort, I plead, and I stand upon the authority of God, of God's very Word, and say that God commands all men everywhere to repent. But speaking of God's character, listen to the way the prophet Nahum in Nahum chapter 1 describes God's character as he writes this. Verse 2 of Nahum 1, he says, A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on His adversaries and He reserves wrath for His enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwind and storm is His way. And clouds are the dust beneath His feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bastion and Carmel wither. The blossoms of Lebanon wither. Mountains quake because of Him. And the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by His presence, the world and all the inhabitants in it. Who can stand before His indignation? Who can endure the burning of His anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and rocks, and the rocks are broken up by Him. Is God gracious? Yes. Is God a God of mercy? Yes. But He is holy and wrathful and just. <clears throat> and His wrath is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. And He tells us this in His Word. And God, and God gives us then His law as we know from the book of Exodus, His Ten Commandments. You shall not lie or steal or blaspheme, but we are liars and thieves and blasphemers. See, God's law is not the problem. It cannot be the way of salvation. Why? Because we ourselves are unable to keep it. We ask ourselves, have we lied? Yes. Have we stolen? Yes. Have we dishonored our fathers and mothers? Yes. Have we committed adultery? Some of us, yes. And then Jesus says in Matthew 5, if you look with lust, you commit adultery. Pornography is adultery. Friends, in our hearts, God sees the hearts. He sees the, he sees the evil that is bound up within the heart of man. Jesus says it is not the things outside of the man that makes him unclean. Rather, it is the things that come out of a man. It are the thing, they are the things that inside of you, inside of your sinful heart, that will bring about your destruction. And that's why you have to come to Christ to, give, to be given a new heart with new desires. As the psalmist says in Psalm 51, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from Your presence. Do not take Your Holy Spirit from me, but restore to me the joy of Your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. That ought to be the cry of our hearts that God would give us new hearts and new desires. That God would save you from yourself. You are your own greatest enemy. Certainly you have this world that is against you and you have Satan who wants your soul destroyed in hell. 
But friends, you, you yourself, your own guilt before God will bring about your destruction. But Jesus came to save us from ourselves that we might not be damned, but rather that we might be eternally blessed. He was cursed that we might be blessed. He was damned that we might be eternally redeemed. He was broken by the Father. Upon the cross, we know that the wrath of God was poured out upon the Son of God who bore it so that His bride, His church, might receive salvation. You husbands out there, do you love your wives? Do you love your wives? The Scripture says that the church is Jesus' bride. If you love your wives, how much more does the God-man, does the eternal Son of God love His church, love His people? How much more is He willing to lay down His life for her? And that He has done. But friends, we've broken the law of God. We need to come to grips with the bad news if we are ever to see the beauty of the good news. The Gospel is not like a Joel Osteen book or a T.D. Fakes book or a Joyce Meyer book or a Beth Moore book. My friends, the Word of God brings to us bad news of our destruction, of our heading for destruction, of our sin before God. And that is man's state by default. At war with God, at enmity with Him, and deserving of His judgment in hell. Hell was ultimately created for who? For Satan and his angels. For we know that when Satan fell, when Lucifer, the chiefest of all angels, fell, he brought down with him one third of the angelic hosts to rebel against God. And so God consigned a place for them to eternally abide. And that was hell. It was not intended for man. But when man fell in the garden, the whole human race in Adam fell. And therefore you and I are born on the road to destruction. But my friends, Jesus Christ came to give us second birth. As the song says at Christmas, the Christmas song says, born to give us second birth. Hark the, her hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. And this newborn King, the Lord Jesus Christ, entered into space and time, was born in a barn in a small town outside of the capital of Israel, of Jerusalem. God bless you, sir. Thank you. And there the God of glory had a humble birth. And He lived a perfect life of obedience to the law of God. Jesus' life of obedience is not meaningless. He came to fulfill the law of God on behalf of His people because we could not do it ourselves. See, in order for us to be saved, God requires absolute perfection, absolute perfect conformity to His standard of righteousness. And so Jesus Christ, the man of grace, fulfills the law of God for His people. In their stead, in their room, and then He goes to the cross and is beat and is spat upon, is made a public mockery. And there He bore the wrath of God. Listen to what the prophet Isaiah writes. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 53 verse 4. Surely our griefs He Himself bore and our sorrows He carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him, and by His scourging we are healed. Verse 10, But Yahweh was pleased to crush Him, putting Him to grief. See, upon the cross, Jesus bore the guilt of His people upon His own shoulders, even though He had no guilt of His own. He was regarded and treated as a guilty man. And He satisfied the wrath of the Father in His perfect death. 
Three days later, Christ was raised from the dead and He is alive. Jesus Christ is alive. We are closer and closer to this day, the Christian holiday, Resurrection Day, where we celebrate the day in which Jesus came back from the dead. And how wonderful is that? That Christ proved by His own actions that the Father had received His atonement upon the cross as the sufficient payment for sin. Because we know from the Old Testament that not every sacrifice was accepted by God. They had to be done rightly. Christ comes and offers Himself up as the perfect, all-sufficient sacrifice for sin. And 40 days later, Christ was exalted to the right hand of God. And there He sits. There He reigns. And there He rules. And you, my friends, you must repent. Turn from sin with grief and hatred of it. And turn to Christ and live. He promises total freedom from sin and life everlasting. Friends, if you do not repent, you will perish. Jesus said in John, or excuse me, in Luke 13:3, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He is a fool who for a drop of pleasure drinks a sea of wrath. My friends, turn from sin and turn to the Savior. That is the call of the Gospel, to believe it. And amazingly, God tells us to do that, but then He says in His Word that it is only possible by the work of God in us. So seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Let the wicked man forsake his way. And let him return. And the Lord will have mercy upon the wicked. I'm from Clinton. Clinton, oh yeah. Yes, sir. God bless you. Excuse me. And so, friends, dear friends, and I call you that because of my care for you. Dear, dear friends, listen, all who repent and believe have forgiveness of sin, and they are wrapped in the righteousness which Christ, through His perfect life, procured. They are saved all by God's grace, all by God's unmerited favor. Grace, grace, grace. And they are given new hearts. They no longer love the things they once loved. They now love the things of God. They love the Word of God and prayer and to share the Gospel with the lost. Because God has done a work in them. So if you say you're a Christian, but you're a hypocrite, it's because you're lost and you need to be saved. If you are a Christian and your life reflects that, then praise God. Go preach Christ. This Gospel is not only for the lost, but for believers as well. Be encouraged by the message of life. It is for our edification. It is for our being built up in righteousness. It is for us, brethren. Religion is stupid. Why is it stupid? What, are you an atheist? It's really stupid. Yeah. Right on, let's go. We got a mic, sir. You can use the microphone. What are we doing? God bless you. Friends. It is all by grace to one end. It's all by grace to the glory of God. It is all to the glory of the triune God. So may God be glorified forevermore. If you're lost, turn to Christ and live. If you know Christ, if you say that you're a Christian and you truly are a Christian, praise God. Walk in holiness, brethren. But if you say you're a Christian, but you're a hypocrite, believe upon Christ and be saved. Be saved forevermore. And so we've seen here in Romans chapter 4, in verse 16, 
that it is salvation is by faith. Reception of the, all the promises of God is by faith. Is by faith. And the true descendants of Abraham are those who follow in His footsteps, the footsteps of faith. We've seen that God is holy and we are sinners. But God sent His Son to save sinners. And all who believe upon the Son of God are saved by His grace and for His glory. To Jesus Christ, the one true God, be all glory, praise and honor forevermore. Amen and amen.